Hi, everyone. Great to see you again, even though I can't see you, but I hope you can see us because it's time. Well, of course, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see us either. So this has got off to a really good start. Steve Cooper, VLGA Connect Summer Series, Let There Be No Doubt. I see you're in your summer attire and I hope you're appropriately chastised after last week. Well, Chris, I've had to go back down to Wilson's Prom, as those who are viewing, not listening, will see. And it's interesting if you um, if you could see the vista of Tidal River behind me, it's, it hasn't changed a bit. The same campers are still there. Um, we've got the same weather and my laptop's in the same gum tree with a direct line of sight to Mount Oberon. All of which just confirms that it is obviously still summer, as Catherine Aunt rightly pointed out on the newsroom this week. So the summer series lives on until the end of February, as does, Thanks. I assume, your rather pleasant but casual attire. <laughs> that will last for the summer series, Chris, because um, we like to remove ambiguity in so far as we can. <laughs> well, oh, w well, how's that setting up this conversation that's coming? Uh, ambiguity, I'm, I'm sure, is going to live on. Um, there's so much happening this week to talk about in the governance space, Steve. Where do we start? Can I start, perhaps, with codes of conduct? We've mentioned a couple of times that councils have until, is it the 24th of February, to four adopt months. their code of conduct, being four months since the general election. I'm it. hearing on the grapevine that some, not a lot, but some councils are challenged by uh, not being able to get the required two-thirds majority for their code. And of course, there's questions being asked about where does this leave them in terms of that deadline? Are you hearing similar things? I've heard a range of stories, Chris. I have heard that some councils are challenged to get the uh, the two thirds of votes necessary to adopt the new code. And that's, I think, a pretty important element to ensure that the code has the ownership of the councillor group beyond any shadow of a doubt. It also kind of reinforces that point that sometimes perfection can be the enemy of progress and certainly some discussions uh, we've been in with councils it's been around um, honourable compromises I suppose or sometimes pushing content that might be in the code back out to policy um, in the interests of the councillor group owning the work that uh, that they've done. So look one of the key things here in the new legislation is that uh, the old code, the existing code, remains in force until the new code's adopted. But that's not to be read as you can take your time post February 24 to adopt the new code because you've got an old one, because you still have to have the new one in place within that four months, am I right? Well, I would say so, Chris. And, and my reading of the legislation was absolutely as you've described it, that until such time as you've got a new code, the old code will apply. But of course, under the 2020 legislation, which I assiduously refused to describe as the new act. Thank you. Um, under the new, under the, I nearly said it. And then. there you go, you've done it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I was being a smarty and it doesn't pay. Um, under the 2020 Act, uh, the code needs to address the standards of conduct, which weren't available under the 1989 Act. So we're, refer we're res reverting to that avoiding ambiguity theme. And as soon as is possible, it really is in the interests of councils to adopt a new code so at least they have an approach to the standards of conduct. I have also heard, Chris, that a number of councils, really because of the time pressure, are dealing with this deadline um, by pretty much buying off the shelf codes um, and there are a number of legal providers that are making that offering. But again, look, in some ways that's not the worst case because at least if there's an awareness that the code in conjunction with other work around constantly reassessing the you know the healthy interaction of the councillor group um, should be revisited quite regularly. So we, we did say the word ambiguity would come up again and you've used it I think at least twice there so if nothing we're delivering on the promise. Um, <laughs> what, con what concerns me Steve is some councils have um, allowed time, they've had a meeting, they've uh, not been able to pass the code, they still have time to hold a special meeting. There's some I hear that are uh, holding a special meeting close to the deadline for the purpose of adopting that code of conduct. If they're unsuccessful, they don't leave themselves much room to, uh, to rectify that. So it remains to be seen, you know, what if any consequences there would be from 
from failing so, to do. Yeah, sorry, Chris. This has always been a bit of a vexed question in terms of the administration of any local government act. That what do the deadlines mean if there's no penalty? Um, and ultimately, look at one level, it goes to reputation that you know the minister and the department sort of get a note that you know you didn't you didn't pass. And, and look, that may or may not be of concern to um, to different councils. I think more importantly, though, um, it goes to the role of the council in terms of tone at the top. What's the message that is sent to the rest of the organisation if the leadership um, arm can't meet deadlines that are enforced under an act, that that might well send a signal that uh, requirements of a piece of legislation actually are a bit discretionary. When clearly the intent is that they're not. So really in terms of a principles-based act, um, I kind of look at it as a sign around, well, how do you do business? And I, and that's not being pejorative because we don't know the individual circumstances and what's gone on in terms of that, but it's a sort of a, just a general um, kind of an indicator um, if it were con to continue. I would agree with that. And my sense is that there's no intention, at least from the government's end, to, to be out there with a big stick it's it's you know it is uh, forgive me for saying new legislation um and it's about assisting and helping to comply and understand the uh, the responsibilities under that it's not about thou shalt not or else um that's my sense yeah, and i'd agree with you chris and look the reality is you know councils are also working on their engagement policies um we're in in full swing with uh the draft budgets moving up to 30th of june and then kicking off all the work that's necessary to uh, to get the integrated strategic planning framework, the remainder of those documents adopted by October. So it is a busy time and it's probably not not one for punitive action unless someone <laughs> falls a lot further off that, um, off that chart of reasonableness. Uh, can we give a plug for the work that, uh, moving on now, Steve, if you didn't get the segue, um, for the work that uh, FinPro have been doing with uh, LGV around the new financial principles. And I understand there are now some working documents available uh, with regard to the model budget, uh, financial plans and revenue plans. Uh, another example of great uh, cross-sector um, collaboration. Oh, absolutely, Chris. And a good reminder that that material is on the Engage Victoria website. And um, given the import um, of those strategic documents um, really merits a look. I mean, I think really the only concern I've got with what you've just said is we are making a disturbing trend of giving Bradley Thomas um, compliments uh, for the work that he's done. <laughs> but in this case, I, I can't argue. It's um, it's well-deserved. And of course, he's juggling the interim CEO role at uh, uh, Massive, no, which one? Hepa, Hepa and Shire. <laughs> Yes, um, or, or, or will be very shortly. Um, the uh, On that note, we do have a bit of news in terms of movements around the sector this week. Um, after 13 years, Steve, Dominic Isola at Hume City Council has announced his resignation this week. That means by my count, we've got or are about to have eight councils with uh, CEO vacancies either currently being uh, recruited or pending. Congratulations to Dominic on 13 years in a significant and really challenging role um, at Hume. Um, because of the importance of that council, the size of the council, the complexity um, across a range of dimensions, um, that's a, a 13 years in that role is a sterling effort. Um, but yeah, a bit going on. <laughs> Indeed. And look, last time we did the scorecard, we we missed, uh, I think you suspected, but I missed uh, West Wimmera off the list. That was the missing one. So Yeah, and I think in the interest of avoiding ambiguity, Chris, we, uh, we made a call that we would share um, the blame for that. Not that we're in a culture of blame, but that uh, we both needed to take responsibility and accountability for that omission. Indeed. <laughs> Another little bit of news that you may or may not have heard this week, Steve, is that LG Pro, fine organisation, the peak member organisation for professionals working in local government in Victoria, has announced its new Chief Executive Officer, and that is Jill Brown, who's coming from the Australian Local Government Association in Canberra, starting after the long weekend in March. I'm particularly delighted to hear about that appointment and I'm looking forward to Jill taking up the role. Well, it's been a seamless transition. I uh, can't quite think of who the interim CEO has been, but apparently it's gone quite well under the interim CEO. Um, congratulations to Jill and to the board on that appointment and all good wishes for LG Pro into the future. An important, an important role. 
That's all the news and gossip I have, Steve. Now, uh, let's get back to uh, important VLGA business. I know the induction program has been continuing and you're at the uh, forefront of delivering that. What are the sorts of issues that you're picking up that are perhaps uh, challenging or exciting new councillors? Yeah, done a bit of code of conduct work during the week, Chris, which has been really uh, interesting with a council that um, has got on the front foot and a group of councillors who'd uh, had a strategic weekend um, uh, backed up for a two and a half hour discussion on that real detail as to how they would best um, address issues in that really important informal stage. Um, got to do some work with uh, Melissa Scadden from Justicial Lawyers on that. And I think really an exciting piece of work that we're able to do there. Um, and I'm really uh, hopeful that councils will do more of that. Um, so that's that's been really interesting. The other thing, working with uh, a couple of other councils, the topic of councillor expenses has come up. And um, we won't necessarily remove all ambiguity on this, Chris, because in the finest um, spirit of uh, sort of bureaucratic speak, the response in a lot of cases will depend. It will depend on what the council's policy describes as a duty. And of course, the policy can't countermand the act. It will depend on the nature of the invitation that's been provided by the organisation. It will depend on the role that the councillor is required to play at the particular event. So um, I think the really positive thing that comes out of those discussions is an alertness for all councillors um, not to be complacent about the councillor expense provisions because um, there are parameters around it. There are certain, um, certain expenses that are best dealt with or um, uh, paid for from the allowance that is received by councillors. And that's why it's an allowance and not a salary. So that's been a really interesting element. There was one other topic. Sure. <laughs> You're going to be stunned by this. Hang on to your chair. Um, the topic of conflict of interest has exercised my brain during the week. Are you OK? Hey. Really? Conflict of interest? That's always been so simple, Steve. Who knew? Um, in a conversation I was in during the week um, with a councillor group, indirectly the notion of the procurement policies of the council came up. And you're aware that the councils, you know, councils already have to review their procurement policy um, annually. Yeah. And one area that might be easily overlooked um, can occur because we take a very literal approach to conflict of interest as a result of reading the Act. So, you know, we we look at the Act and it talks about material and general or perceived conflicts of interest. There is, of course, a third sort of conflict of interest that you'll find in the textbooks, Chris, and that's the one about potential conflicts of interest, mm -hmm. something that's not a conflict now, but an, some events might occur in the future that might cause someone to look back and say, oh, it was a conflict. You know, I mean, the standard, the, the classic is awarding a contract and then going off and um, taking a job with the uh, the successful contractor. That's OK at the time, but crikey, something might be difficult. Yeah. I got to thinking, Chris, that there are across every avenue of council business, and I can think of a couple that I've been involved with over the years where you would get a specialist in to provide strategic technical advice around the direction that you might choose to take. But a lot of consultants that we use, um, the example I was thinking of where I've been involved in is media strategy. Um, and I could imagine land use, recreational planning, a whole lot of issues where the provider of the strategic advice may well have an arm of the business where they also engage themselves in implementation of the advice that's been provided. So what to do? Um, my sense of it is that there are many such contracts where if, if it is conceivable, uh, reasonably foreseeable, that a, a condition of tender for that first piece of strategic advice might be to preclude the successful tenderer from uh, competing for work that is involved in the implementation of the advice provided. So um, I completely agree with that. I just want to make the point that's not new. No. That's that's, that, that's thinking that should have been in place prior to LGA 2020. Absolutely. And I think the thing, um, the reason why it struck me, Chris, is that we're very busy and 
you know, at the moment, we've kind of need a laser like like focus on what are we doing to implement the 2020 Act. But that focus might cause us to be blindsided if we don't look a little bit more broadly. Um, and ultimately, um, what I've just said is really about public trust and trust of the organisation in information that's being provided, because there is no ulterior motive for the giving of the information. It should absolutely uh, be seen to just respond to the brief. Good point, Steve. And it, it absolutely right. We should revisit some of these things on a on a regular basis in case we lose sight of them because of the new shiny thing that's <laughs> over here taking taking our attention. I wasn't necessarily talking about legislation. No, so but it's also a good reason why internal consultation is important. Um, often when we're scoping work to get a diverse group around the table, because if you if you've got the same mindset. Um, making these sorts of decisions, you can be blindsided to risk to the organisation. So internal, you know, internal cons consultation, consultation with stakeholders generally is a really important phase. And when we're busy, sometimes it's uh, much easier to skip over that part. Steve, we're going to have to wrap it up. Gosh, you can talk when you're on summer vacation. Uh, we're out of time. Um, don't forget Fast Track, AGM, all of that. But Catherine will update us on those on the newsroom. Um, folks, the governance update comes to you every week. The newsroom feature, which is more newsy, is our catch fry. The more newsy newsroom uh, comes oh, to you. The intro, on is, the intro is stunning, Chris. Well done. Well done. Yeah, to it's almost and like it's been good. professional. It's almost like it's been professionally made. It's terrific, isn't it? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, uh, Steve. Have a have a great week there, wherever you are on the tidal river. Was it? That's it. Yep. And we'll tell, see you. Tell my relatives, but that's where I am. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Steve Cooper, Chief of Staff at the VLGA, but more importantly, our governance guru with us on VLGA Connect Summer Series. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>